Hello and welcome to this Nature Research Custom Media webcast titled Detection of the Neutralizing Antibody Against SARS-CoV-2 Using the ELISA Test. My name is Sarah Hiddleston and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by GenScript. We'll begin the webcast with a presentation from Dr. Linfa Wang, Professor and Director of the Emerging Infectious Diseases Programme at Duke NUS Medical School, Singapore. We'll then move on to a question and answer session. You can ask a question at any time you wish throughout the webcast. To do so, please type your question in where it says type your questions here and then press submit and we will answer them later on today. And now over to Dr. Wang. Thank you. And I get my slides on, and I hope you can all see my slides. Great. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Yeah, so I have a slightly you know, different topic, but it's the same thing. Basically, it's determined neutralization, uh, 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 neutralizing antibodies, and I type this importance and the challenge of COVID-19 serology. So this is a brief outline, and I go through a little bit about this COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV-2, some basic virology, and really introducing the concept of neutralizing antibodies. And the methods, you know, we use to determine neutralizing antibodies. And then really the bulk of the talk is about this new test we call uh, surrogate virus neutralization, and the commercial tree name is CPAS. And I try to differentiate between the binding antibodies versus the neutralizing antibodies. And also discuss, you know, it's a hot topic. Can neutralizing antibodies be used as a biomarker for protect immunity? And with, you know, the vaccine on the market now and mass vaccination, and also COVID-19 patients recover, the question of immunity longevity is also in the front mind of not only scientists, but also the public, uh, you know, domain. And then, you know, the concern about these variants of concerns, VOCs, many of them, and keep coming up. Last but not least, I think the topic, again, is uh, very uh, close to everybody's, you know, mind is that how can we open up the travel? Do we need a, a vaccine passport? Is a vaccine passport good enough? Or do we need a really functional immunity passport? So I start with, you know, general comments about, you know, almost my career because I have been really studying emerging zoonotic virus for, for a long, long time, 30 years to be exact. And it's interesting because you see virus is almost like a terrorist, you know. So this is like, you know, in uh, 2002, now it's almost 20 years ago, when the defense uh, secretary from USA, Donald Rumsfeld, you know, made this very famous speech about fighting terrorists, you know, how difficult it is because you're dealing with three different types, right? You have the known knowns, you have the known unknowns, and you have the unknown unknowns. I think, you know, a lot of people laughed at him, think it's very confusing and does not mean anything, and me included. But so now 20 years later, I felt like, you know, this is actually a very, very uh, good summary of the difficulty facing fighting something in the dark, whether it's a terrorist or a virus. So this basically is my career. I was trained as a biochemist, but then accidentally went into infection disease and virology. So when I was in Australia, you know, uh, this hangover virus emerged in 94. From there, we studied the Nipah virus in Malaysia, Singapore, and now in India, Bangladesh, Philippines. Of course, the SARS virus 17 years ago, I discovered the origin of the SARS from bats and the MERS uh, 10 years ago, Ebola in West Africa and now COVID-19. So for me, that SARS-CoV-2 is a known unknown, right? When SARS first emerged, it's an unknown unknown. So we really caught unprepared and had no knowledge. But for COVID-19, it's really now we call it's a known unknown. So basic virology, I'm sure people in the audience have seen this image many, many times, whether it's you know on print media, social media, on TV. Basically, this is uh, enhanced the graphics of the COVID-19 virus. And the triangle you see is the triangle of the spike protein. So if you do a section of the virus, that's a spike protein. 
And for coronavirus, you know, it's kind of unique because this is the largest non-segmented RNA virus. The genome, you know, comes close to, you know, 30, 30 something kilobases. And obviously that it's the lots of protein encoded. So if you get an infection, your body will produce lots, lots of different antibodies and binds to different parts of the genome or the protein. What we call them is binding antibodies. So when you get an infection, you induce, as I say, you know, uh, hundred, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, different antibodies, and they binds to different parts. But the most functional meaningful antibody is what we call neutralizing antibodies. And uh, thanks to our research to the SARS coronavirus, which is very close, basically, we now call it SARS-1, right? SARS-1 and SARS-2 are basically the same virus species, and they share 80% uh, genome identity. For that reason, as soon as we discussed uh, SARS-CoV-2, we realized that you know, the neutralizing antibody mostly also direct against this spike protein, and more specifically is the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, or RBD. So neutralizing antibody, as I said, is very important because it's really the most important functional antibody. And traditionally, we determine that using a virus neutralization test. So on the left is a diagram. So you have a live virus, obviously, and then for SARS-CoV-2, it's a biosafety level three. So you cannot deal with that kind of assay, the VNT, in a normal lab. In the BSA-2 lab, you have to go to BSA-3. And then the principle is relatively simple because you have a live virus attached to the receptor get in into the cell and then you call CPE. In the presence of neutralizing antibodies and then some of them will br block this entry and then you don't see a CPE. So it's called a gold standard. Gold for specificity and functionality. It's not gold for everything because sensitivity and uh, cost, safety, time, you know, consuming, you know, all these are actually disadvantages, okay? So for COVID-19, you know, from day one to until today, we are talking about over now uh, uh, 14 months, you know, so we're still struggling really on a lot of issues, herd immunity, immunity passport, you have heard of, longevity of uh, protect immunity, and then convalescent plasma for therapy or monochrome antibody for therapy, and the vaccine efficacy, we're talking about different vaccines and the same vaccine against the different uh, variants. So these are all kind of what I call it's a human sort of related applications in red. Then even 14 months later, we still do not know how COVID started. Where did the virus originate? You know, is there an intermediate host from bats to human, you know, in something in between? So we still, you know, research is still on going on to search for the natural reservoir and the intermediate host. And then also COVID-19 is the first emerging zoonotic virus pose a real possibility and the risk of what we call a reverse zoonotic transmission. That means human to animal transmission. So all of these studies, that serology will play a role. But we need a really the top end serology, very specific and determine the functional neutralizing antibody not only that, we want this to perform in a species independent serology. Because we, we are not going to be able to develop a serology for human and another for bats and another for pangolins and another for mink, you know. So we have to do all in one. So this is where we came in. So from very early on, you know, so uh, uh, January last year, we had the idea of developing neutralizing antibodies. And then about March, we came up with this uh, surrogate virus neutralization test. So surrogate virus neutralization test really addressed both challenges, right? By determining neutralizing antibodies in a species independent manner and independent of BSS3 containment. So our preprint was posted on the Research Square uh, uh, March 23rd last year. And a few months later in July, this paper was published in Nature Biotech. The invention was quite simple kind of, you know, on paper. It's basically a biochemical simulation of the virus neutralization test I have just shown you. So this is the whole virus neutralization test. You know, so this is the membrane surface of a cell. And you have the receptor in this case is ACE2. 
and you have the COVID-19 virus, and then the spike protein, especially the IBD, binds to the ACE2 and gets entry. In the presence of neutralized antibody, that's blocked. For the, our SVNT, we use protein engineering to get it really in a very simple ELISA form. First of all, we express a soluble extracellular protein of ACE2. So now we can express, purify, and the coat on the ELISA plate. For the virus, we only use one small part of the protein. That's the receptor binding domain already introduced. So we use the RBD instead of whole spike protein. And we chemically conjugate with the horse ratchet pox. That is the most frequently used enzyme for ELISA. So now from a three to five day experiment that required BSS3 to a one hour test, basically you mix your antibody to be tested to the HRP IBD conjugate. And 30 minutes later, you transfer that mix onto the plate that you already have the AC to immobilize on the plate. And then 15 minutes late, wash. One wash and then you're ready, ready to read the uh, uh, results. So what basically is, is a blocking asset you're looking for is reduction. If the color you know, completely reduced, then you have a very high neutralizing antibody. If it's a partial reduced, then you can have a medium or low neutralizing antibody. And we have, a, a, of course, formula to calculate for that. Now, if you want to claim this is a surrogate virus neutralization, the first thing people ask is how does it perform against the conventional live virus neutralization? And most people now use the plaque reduction neutralization test or PINT. So here on the X axis is PINT data, and on the Y axis is the surrogate virus neutralization, SVNT or CPAS. So as you can see that the correlation is fantastic. R square is 0 0.95. And the other thing, of course, you know, you want to validate for specificity and the sensitivity. So very early on, we had, a, you know, a cohorts of uh, confirmed SARS-CoV-2 patients from Singapore and from China. And uh, as you can see that the specificity is basically 100%. And the sensitivity varies from 98 all the way to 100%, depends on the cohorts you use. So basically, that's a test now. You know, on our routine usage, we completely replace the live virus-based neutralization test. And that commercial kit was launched on May 15th. So I always say, you know, this is a COVID-19 speed. We had a concept developed on March 10th, and then we patented this on March 24th. And then we have a product, fully uh, a licensed product, basically May 15th, and we got approval by FDA as the first and also the only test that detects directly neutralized antibodies for SARS-CoV-2. So FDA approved that in November. So the question people always ask me is that, you know, can antibody test predict the protect immunity? And to me, I said this actually two sub questions. The first question is that most of the antibody tests you're familiar with and commercialized, as I said, except the CPAS, every other test that commercialized is measuring binding antibodies. So binding antibodies depends on how you develop and which antigen you use can have a good correlation with the neutralizing antibody, but it's not a direct measure of neutralizing antibody. So that's number one. So I will show you data. Number two is once you have a specific way like the SVNT, then you can really detect the true neutralizing antibody. Then the next question is, can NAB neutralizing antibody be used to correlate with protection? So the first statement I want to make is body antibodies is not equal to neutralizing antibodies. So in our Nature Biotech paper, that's most elegantly uh, demonstrated by using monoclonal antibodies. So we're only showing four here, but in the paper, if you read it, we have 16 maps uh, you know, from four different species, animal species, of three animal and one human. So here I'm showing is uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies from mouse. So we have four mouse monoclonal antibodies, and these are selected with their strong binding to the IBD. So these are RBD specific. 
So they bind to RBD with very strong affinity, especially that red one for A1D10, as you can see. Exactly same RBD protein was used for binding and also for neutralization in CPAS. So if you come to the right side, now you're doing neutralization, as you can see, only two out of four had this percentage inhibition, which is a measurement of neutralization. And as you can see that actually, the red one has the strongest binding now completely failed to neutralize. So this is like a you know, black and white demonstration of you can have a good body antibodies, but they don't neutralize. The next few slides show you human series, you know, from either published or in this case is a preprint. So this is a very early on, you know, you have this neutralization title determined by PINT, and then you have the binding antibodies in this preprint, I have to emphasize that's not my work. This preprint uses three different binding antibody assays, one from Roche, one from Abbott, and one from Euroimmune. As you can see, the R square basically goes from 0.3 to around you know, 0.48, 47. So it's all below 0.5. And I already show you that, right? The correlation of our C pass versus PNT is 0.95. So a huge difference. This is a very important paper just published, you know, uh, uh, about months ago now. So this is published in Lancet. As you know, the COVID-19 or the uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2 outbreak started in Wuhan in China. So there has always been a question asked because, you know, they were the first to experience that. When there's already human to human transmission going on, we still did not know which virus and we did not have, even have a PCR test. So later, of course, you know, it's a disaster and a lot of people unfortunately died. And the final conclusion is that, you know, it's around, you know, uh, uh, 80,000 people basically got infected in Wuhan, you know, so that's a PCR confirmed two COVID-19 cases. But there's always a question whether there are more people get infected. So this is a longitudinal kind of serologic test and serum samples were collected in April to May last year in Wuhan. So the important thing is they use a pan immunoglobulin, basically is a binding antibody assay for serology. And the first finding they had is to say, actually the serum prevalence in the, you know, uh, around uh, 4,600 household, around the 10,000 individuals that they have sampled is around 7%. So if a 7% serum prevalence for a city of 11 million, and you can calculate, it's more than 700,000. So obviously the original kind of confirmed case of 80,000 is underestimated. So that's finding number one. Finding number two is that among these 7% zero positive, only around 40% have neutralizing antibodies. So basically that, you know, among the people who have binding antibodies, 60% of them don't have neutralized antibodies. Either they never had it or the neutralized antibody already disappeared. So this is another really important illustration to say measuring binding antibodies by the commercial test does not tell you the functional neutralizing antibody. So next question is, can neutralized antibody be correlated with protection? Again, these are not my words. So this is from the Johns Hopkins uh, National Strategy for Serology Report and, you know, the famous Fauci, Dr. Fauci. So both basically says, you know, neutral antibody are the gold standard for protect immunity. And it's obviously very important for SARS-CoV-2 as well. So many papers published really to confirm that, but I just want to, you know, I mean, time is limited. I will just show a few papers that from different angles. So the first one is the first one published. It's to me, it's still the most interesting paper. It's from a very unique study. In Seattle, there's a fishing vessel going out to, you know, fishing. And uh, that the Washington University in Seattle, the, the research team there collaborated with it, and they take blood samples for every one of these 122 crew members before they left and they PCR them. Of course, everybody is PCR negative. Otherwise, you know, you're not allowed to go, right? And then, unfortunately, some people still get sick during that period, and they have to come back, you know, either 18 to 50 days, 
on the average of you know 30 uh, uh, one month. What's amazing is that it's almost like a human transmission study because on the vessel, you know, you have nowhere to go, right? So the transmission was very efficient. Eventually, you get an 85% attack rate. So one of four of 122 all get infected. And here is just one table I'm going to show you. So before they started, of course, as I said, all negative by PCR, but they also did a serology. And the serology says that uh, the Abbott test says that six persons are positive by binding antibodies, but the neutralized antibody by you know, a, a PINT or pseudovirus, and in this case, they also use the CPAS, the ACT block, is to say only three have neutralized antibody. The other three are just binding antibody positive, neutralized antibody negative. Remember, there's 85% attack rate. So out of these six, when they come back, all three that had the neutralized antibodies on the top are protected. They did not have any viral material. With the three showing this positive binding antibody but negative neutralized antibody, all infected, and the CT is 17 to like 23, very high viral load. So this is a beautiful study. I always say it's like human challenge study. Of course, you know, it's not intentional, but uh, the results is a beautiful study. Basically says neutralize antibody if you already have it and it's correlated with protection. This is a nature paper published by a, a, a group from Harvard. Uh, so this is now non-human primate studies. As I say, you know, human challenge studies are difficult to do. So this is a, a, a non-human primate. So you immunize the non-human primates and uh, you get neutralizing antibodies, as we already know. And that what they did is basically plasma transfer. So it's a passive immunization. So you transfer this to naive monkeys and uh, then you use a different dose. What they discovered is that plasma alone is good enough for protection against challenge. Basically to say, if you have high neutralized antibodies, you don't need a T cell immunity. The second conclusion is to say, actually you don't need a very high titers, relatively low titers of neutralized antibody is sufficient for protection. This is a preprint and came out again, uh, uh, just over months ago. So it's a paper published by a, uh, group of leading scientists from Australia, but the study is actually not limited to Australian data. They basically gather all the public data from seven vaccine trials, as well as all the published convalescent in the cohort data, and they did the mathematical modeling and did all the analysis, tried to basically came to conclusion that neutralization level, antibody level, is highly predictive of immune protection. And again, you don't need a very high level of neutralized antibody to be protected. And so this is the neutralization titer here, and this is a protective e efficacy here. So, I mean, this is no secret anymore, right? The mRNA vaccines are to on top, and the, the, uh, then the Novavax, you know, uh, uh, subunit vaccine, and we have the AstraZeneca here, and you go to the inactive vaccines, the Sinovac and the Sinopharm. So using all of this data, what they can also correlate is that the using the neutralizing antibody in the prediction algorithm, they can predict this efficacy, okay? So this is a predicted efficacy, and these are observed efficacy, and that's the line here. And as you can see, the data actually is fantastic. Now the next topic is on immunity longevity. So there have been papers, you know, very early on, almost this time in the last year, people were already discussing about, oh, neutralized antibody does not last, you know, three months later, they're dropping. And then eight months later, say, oh, don't worry, neutralizing antibody lasts at least eight months. I think of both statements, I mean, these are headlines, you know, of course, in, in media. Both are correct, but both are wrong. So what they are basically emphasize is one study rather than get into the individual uh, 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 SARS patient in terms of their immunity longevity. So this a paper came out uh, again months ago in, in Lancet Micro and from our own group. So what we did is that using the CPAS and the Singapore COVID-19 cohort, we start with 200 something, but 164 patients were nice enough to come back 
and we did a nine months longitudinal study. What we found is that it's not a one for all. We have multiple neutralizing antibody waning dynamic groups. And the neutralizing antibody depends on who you are and how severe your symptom is, lasts from days to decades. So here are the data, and it's published. I'm going to just show you one you know, uh, figure data. And uh, so five different groups. One group never had a neutralizing antibody, and another group, for some reasons, the neutralizing antibody slowly, but you know, consistently going up. So these are to the outliers. So we basically did not focus on the majority is in the middle. So they all had a neutralizing antibodies, you know, when they are one or two months uh, past their infection. Then they went differently. The first we call rapid waning, the second we call slow waning, and the third one we call, you know, persistent kind of waning group, you know. And the first group, the neutralizing antibody lasts from 35 to 148 days, medium is 96, seven second is double that, third is a triple of the second group. And so the extreme is 35 days to almost 15,000 days, which is 41 years. So obviously beyond the nine months, you know, we use a mathematical modeling, but the model was proved because uh, uh, kind of validated because we established the mathematical model, used the data as we had from six months after the symptom onset. And then during the uh, review of the paper, we had the data for the next three months. So we use that to validate the, the model basically. So the conclusion is that uh, neutralized antibodies can last very long or very short and depends on you. So this is also reflected, you know, in this paper I already mentioned, you know, that the preprint from the Australian group, the other discovery they made is on the longevity. Said so we found that the decay of neutralizing title in vaccinated subjects over the first three to four months was at least as rapid as the decay observed in convalescent objectives. So just like a what we discovered from the you know, convalescent cohort, you can expect, of course, that it's not going to be uniform. Some people you know, went faster than others. So the last topic I'm going to cover is about variants of concerns. Clearly, right now, that's a major concern. And we don't know whether the, you know, the second wave in India is caused by the, the variants. In Brazil, definitely variants play a role, and in South Africa, it did too. Okay, so when we think of variants, these are the questions people are asking. Are they more transmissible? Are they more virulent or deadly? And the, can the current vaccine protect against them? I think the last question is most relevant. If we believe that, you know, with the international collaboration, eventually we will get most people vaccinated, get a, a herd immunity. Then this is really an important question. You know, the first two questions are mostly relevant if you have a naive population. So the other advantage of this uh, uh, SMNT or CPAS is that it's an in vitro test and it's very safe and it's very quick to adapt. So as soon as we, you know, heard of this variant as a concern by the WHO. We developed this C pass for the variant. So we now have the C pass for the parental strain we call white type. We have the C pass for the 117 UK, and we have the C pass for 1.351 for the South African. And now we have C pass for the Indian others as well. So I'm just showing data the for, for the first two variants. You know, especially South African, you know, seems to be most concerned. So these are very you know early data. We have much more you know uh, manuscripts being prepared. So the black represents the, so these are all from uh, COVID-19 patient zero, and we are purposely choosing high, median, low. So as you can see that when you do a C pass, that's we already know with the you know, original IBD. And if you use the IBD from this UK or South African variant, as you can see, uniformly, the neutralizing antibody titer is lower than the white type, but, that slope of dropping really depends on the individual and also on the original initial level. The initial level is low, you drop faster. Initial level is high, you drop slower. Okay, so that's from patient. So how about vaccinees? So in Singapore, we only had a one vaccine when we did this study. Everybody was vaccinated by Pfizer. And Pfizer, as you know, produced very strong neutralizing antibodies, you know, so 
it's n equal to five because we did it very early on. And for some reason that we cannot differentiate between the Y tab and the, the UK variant, you know, looks like even a little bit high, but uh, fail to say no, no reduction. But for the South African, even with such a good vaccine, and this is the serum take at the peak, two to three weeks after second dose, you already see the drop, you know, so from like 97% all the way to 70%, okay? So you're talking about more than 20% drop before the neutralized antibodies start to win, okay? So depends on how you do the cutoff. If we do a 50% of the inhibition in CPAS as a cutoff, then you say, okay, if you're vaccinated, you're safe for all two variants for the time being. If they dropped here, then it's not. But for those who recovered, then bad news. You know, these three individuals are already susceptible, you know, for this variant. If you raise this to 70%, you know, that's the cutoff that FDA uses from convalescent uh, 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 plasma therapy. Then you have four recovered is now potentially susceptible. And the, even the vaccinated, you have one that's susceptible. So reinfection and the breakthrough infections are the two terminologies now you see in the media. Reinfection means that uh, you have had COVID-19 and you recover and got reinfected either by the same similar virus, the parental virus, or by a new variant. The breakthrough infection is that you're vaccinated and you still get infected. Unfortunately, for all of these cases, very few of them have a neutralizing antibody level determined before they either got reinfection or breakthrough infection. We only have a few cases, now it's N equal to maybe five to six, that when people get reinfected and we had CPAS data, basically the neutralized antibody level, then all of these reinfected had either no or very low neutralized antibodies. And you have to say that China now is the most controlled country in terms of you know, quarantine and the border clo closure and things like that. Even under these very stringent conditions, healthcare workers fully vaccinated still get infected. Last but not least, the breakthrough infection in Israel. Israel is now the most uh, uh, vaccinated nation in terms of percentage of population get vaccinated. So what they observed is beautiful. You know, you have a huge reduction of infection in the population. But for those do, unfortunately enough to get a breakthrough infections, the majority is by this South African B1351 variant. Compare with the non-vaccinated population and the vaccinated population, the percentage of the, this uh, South African variant is eight times higher than the non-vaccinated. So basically, the breakthrough infection is select for this variant. So this is a concern, of course. So factors to consider if we want to open the border and use something called an immunity passport. One is that protect immunity, right? Neutralizing antibody obviously is one, but a T cell immunity is also important. But on the practicality level, currently we only have one FDA approved neutralization antibody test that can be done on large scale, and there's no approved T cell. Even if it's approved, I don't think it can do large scale. Then we have to consider, you know, if you use a, a, a vaccine passport, you know, and then a vaccine efficacy, you have to be considered. Immediate longevity, I already demonstrated to you that reinfection and also the waning of the neutralized antibody. Last but not least is the variations. We have different vaccines against the same virus, or we have the same vaccines against different virus. So how do you normalize this? And to me that you have to have a functional test rather than just have a piece of paper to say you're vaccinated three months ago or six months ago. So ever since the vaccine was on the sort of horizon, there's a talking about a, a vaccine passport. So this was like, you know, early November 23rd last year, the Qantas, the Australian airline, Qantas basically want the government to, you know, uh, uh, allow them to have a vaccine passport. Basically, they will not allow people to take on international flight until you answer the yes to this question, are you vaccinated? To me, that this is the first step. And I think the more relevant question is, are you CPAS? Basically, have you been COVID passed to demonstrate that you have a, a functional protection? You know, 
So I'm going to end up to say, you know, the second message is really vaccine passport does not equal to immunity passport. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and then do have to decline my conflict interest because uh, I'm an inventor on a, a patent application and uh, SVNG uh, kit is now uh, marketed by GeneScript under the trade name of CPAS. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang, for that completely fascinating and hugely important uh, talk. It is now time for the question and answer session. To ask Dr. Wang a question, please type it in where it says type your questions here and then press submit. So, uh, Dr. Wang, to get us started, I wanted to ask you about the variants because we've had a number of questions come in and I will try to group them together. Yeah. How does the test work for um, new variants? Um, yeah. And you already explained that the test is specific, uh, not specific to one, but to uh, others. Um, can you speak more to this subject? Yeah. So this whole SVNT was based on the specific interaction of the receptor, the human ACE2 molecule. So that's the common, whether, you know, you get infected by different variants. We, you know, the polymorphism is very limited. So we all have the same receptor molecule. But when the variants comes, they have different amino acids in this RBD, the receptor binding domain, that which binds to the ACE2 receptor. So our specific SMNT or CPAS is designed to block that interaction. So even with the slightest change on the RBD, for example, the Wuhan strain to the UK strain is only one amino acid change. And our test, as I have shown already, was able to differentiate that. And then for the South African variant, there was three amino acid change in the RBD and the, the differentiation is greater. So now we have data, you know, for the others, you know, uh, uh, to come on the uh, on the line. So, so these are done one by one, and we are working with GenScript now to develop a multiplex CPAS. Basically, you have a drop of blood, human serum, or you need a few microliter, and you put it into a reaction. Now that reaction has all the different CPAS invisible to the operator, but when you read it out then you get a percentage inhibition against each of the RBDs. So we can actually differentiate that to say, you are most likely to be infected by which variant. Or if you're vaccinated as an individual, we not only can tell you to say, oh, you are neutralizing antibody is fantastic, not, not dropping, or oh, sorry, your neutralizing antibody is dropping, but we can tell you the dropping is 15% to the original strain, you know, 20% to the UK variant, and 45% to the South African. For example, we can do that now. Fantastic, thank you very much. Yeah. Our next question seeks to understand whether or not it's possible to uh, analyze neutralizing antibody levels prior to exposure or markers for it in the clinic. Um, what is the increased tendency to create neutralizing antibodies versus binding antibodies? Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a clinical testing, because uh, the binding antibodies were commercialized first. So most uh, uh, clinical labs are used to these binding antibodies. And I always say that this is fine. Binding antibody is good enough for the early phase of COVID-19 because the question is different. The early phase of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, the question is, are you infected by COVID-19? Because if you present something, you know, PCI is already negative. So you had a fever and you had a cough three months ago, and now you want to know whether you had a COVID-19. So PCR test is too late. This is a retrospective test, and you use serology. So binding antibody is good enough, okay? And for contact tracing and all this application. But now we are at this exit strategy. Basically, we want to know that whether we are protected you know, against infection and whether the vaccine we have been taking is uh, effective. And so in this multiplex CPAS, you have the RBD there. So if we just do RBD binding, use a vaccine or a convalescent human serum, they could not differentiate because if the RBD is from, you know, the Wuhan strand, UK strand, South African strand, 
as I said, they only differ by one to three amino acids. If you look at the binding antibody to the RBD, they have the same reading, no matter which RBD you use. Only when you use this uh, SVNT principle to look at neutralization against their binding to the ACE2, then we can differentiate. So this is a long answer, but I thought it's very important for your audience is that, uh, yes, binding antibody and neutralizing antibody, you know, is uh, kind of does not differentiate in the early phase of pandemic. From now on, once you're vaccinated, if you won't worry about infection by variant, then I think a neutralizing antibody is the only way out because body antibody could just tell you. Yeah. Thank you for that very clear answer. Yeah. Uh, our next question talks about RBD independent independent neutralization. Yeah. Um, so they're asking what about that uh, specifically? What about blocking S1 or S2 cleavage? Yeah. Very, very important question. And, uh, you know, I can admit you know, our paper almost got accepted in nature, but because of that question was kind of eventually published in Nature Biotech, you know, not saying not Nature Biotech is not a good journal, but uh, still. So basically is that uh, we tried the full spike protein and the S1 and RBD, and we found that the RBD based the surrogate virus neutralization is the most sensitive. And we realized the price we pay is we're going to missing some of the neutralizing antibody, which is RBD independent. But more and more paper and our own work basically says that the RBD independent neutralizing antibodies accounts for less than 5% of the total neutralizing antibodies. So first, I admit our test does not cover 100%, but I think uh, we have data and other people have published to say that we cover at least 95% of the neutralizing antibody. Thank you very much. Our next question asks why we're concerned about the longevity of neutralizing antibodies if we believe in the memory of B cells. What would you say to that? Oh, so the memory of B cell is there to that so that B cell will be activated when you're exposed again. Okay. So by the time you get exposed, and then you have a very rapid increase of the antibody, but you're already infected. So this is the question I think, you know, it's being debated a lot is that, uh, do you take a vaccine to prevent disease or do you pay, take a vaccine to prevent infection as well or transmission? Okay. So that if you take a vaccine to prevent disease, then yes, the memory B cell and also the T cells, you know, obviously, you know, if there's any T cell, you know, immunology in the audience, I don't want to give you the impression that neutralizing antibody is the only one important, you know, and T cells are very important. But T cells are important only after the virus already in your body and already replicated into your cell, some of the cells, and then they will activate the T cells. So memory B cells are important, of course, but for to prevent the absolutely early stage of the infection, then I think you need to have circulating neutralized antibodies and it has to be at a decent level. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question asks about creating an assay to test for neutralizing antibodies. Should we just use RBD as the surface? Sorry, I, I kind of don't understand it's this question. Our, yeah, the question it's is... A, it's a neutralizing antibody. So just use RBD to bind to RBD without AC2? I think so. I think Yeah, so question. this is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, I mean, we have a commercial... Uh, uh, kids, many, many of them are RBD uh, uh, binding antibodies. And uh, I already showed that, you know, in my uh, talk, whether I use the monoclonal antibodies or use human serums, that uh, uh, you have binding antibodies, which does not neutralizing. Okay. So basically, if you use a RBD to do a serology, that it's a correlation to neutralize antibody. It's not a direct measurement of neutralizing antibody. So that's point number one. And point number two, I have to emphasize again, you know, from now on, the major concerns, you know, for WHO, CDC, or any government is about variant. So if you want to measure antibodies, just bind to RBD, it doesn't matter whether you use RBD of the Wuhan strain, the UK strain, or the South African, the Indian, the Brazilian strain, their readings will be similar. 
But if you use our SMT or CPAS, we'll tell you that neutralized antibody levels can be substantially different. So that measuring neutralized antibody estimation by an RBD binding assay is okay if you just want an estimation. But I think you will get into the danger zone if you want to know exact level of neutralized antibody, especially their ability to neutralize the different variants. You cannot do that by just using RBD in a binding ELISA. Okay, and that leads us nicely actually onto the next question, which asks if neutralizing antibodies and binding antibodies produced from different strains are the same, and if not, how you would design the assay to cater to the different strains. Can you speak more to that? Yeah, so obviously that uh, even from the same virus, when they infect different individuals, they produce different antibodies. So that's what we call immunodominant or not immunodominant. So obviously we already know that when you're infected or immunized with the current vaccine, which is uh, basically designed against the parental strain, the Wuhan strain, that for sure that first, we have demonstrated different individuals give you slightly different antibodies. Although the immunodominant antibody is the same, the epi is same, but you have other antibodies different. So that's the first thing. That the answer to the first question is that even the same virus or same vaccine will produce different antibodies. Secondly, if now you're faced with different variants, definitely it's different. Because if it's the same, if the variants produce the same neutralizing antibody as the Y type, then our vaccine should protect the variants same as the parental strain. And the data already show my data, the Israel data, you know, the soft reference data, all demonstrate to say, no, it's different. Whether you have been infected or vaccinated against the parental strain, and now you are demonstrate a different neutralization pattern. Of course, that difference differs among individuals. So I hope I you know, made myself clear it's a very complex, uh, complicated situation. So, you know, when people ask me for advice, I say, you know, if you're really serious about yourself, the only way to find out is to take a test because you cannot predict yet. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question asks about CPAS, and you'll be happy to know that in this case, yeah. they've done 3,000 tests, tests wow. with uh, okay. CPAS. Yeah. Um, the question here is, do we need to cor correlate and plot graphs for standardization uh, compared with known positive sera? Uh, in this case, they've used 20 and 80 percentile method. Yes, yes. I think, you know, this is where the CPAS itself, I think, is evolving technology. As I said, the first generation CPAS is against the parental strain only. And... FDA only gave us EUA for qualitative assay. So basically, it's a yes or no, whether you have neutralizing antibody or no neutralizing antibody, okay? So now CPAS kind of, you call it next generation or generation two CPAS, is we are waiting for FDA approval to give us a quantification, okay? So once we have this approval, then we have two things we can help you for those of you who already use the CPAS, you know, for that many tests is that, in the future, you can buy a calibration kit so that you know we have a, a, a positive calibration kit. You can calibrate the percentage inhibition against that antibody, and that antibody already being calibrated against the international units defined by WHO. So the WHO just released a positive international standard with defined international units of neutralization against SARS-CoV-2. So we have done all of this. We have the data, but we cannot give you until FDA approves. So once FDA approves, what we are hoping is that next time you do CPAS, you're not going to report as percentage inhibition. You're going to report international units per mil. That then be translatable to any other lab in any other country because ideally, Everybody will use IU per meal, whether you use a CPAS, use a pseudovirus or live virus, PINT, micro neutralization. Eventually, 
WHO want to have a standardized rate out. Just like, you know, nowadays, if you go vaccinated for hepatitis B and you take a test, you get an international units. That's defined by WHO. So sooner or later, that's going to happen. Of course, the complication before we even get an FDA approval, we already have a complication because that international standard was defined against the parental strain, right? The Wuhan strain. So obviously, the international units were vary against the South Africa and the Brazil and the Indian strain. So, as I say, you know, the whole field is evolving. The vaccine technology is evolving and CPAS is evolving. But I can assure you that we can catch up very fast. As soon as there's a variant, we have, we have CPAS. And as soon as they have a different international standard, we have a different calibration for you. Good to know. Thank you very much. Our next question asks whether or not rapid waning is related to age. Very good question. So I'm in that age group, so I hate to tell you yes. <laughs> so two things, two things that are determining your level of neutralizing antibody and the speed of waning, okay? So these are actually related. If you have a low level, you win fast. If you have a high level, you win slower. So and age, we just find out from the vaccinees, there is some correlation, although the uh, uh, cohort size is not big enough, so we are not ready to publish. But unfortunately, my own antibody I knew I'm waning faster than my postdoc, you know, so that's I know for a fact, okay, n equal to one. But then the other really more important, you know, for uh, patients is uh, the severity of disease. So unfortunately, that when you get an infection, if you get a severe, you suffer more and you maybe end up in ICU. But after you recover, then you are ahead of the mild patients because your neutral antibody is higher and your waning speed is lower. So this is really important. You know, I want to really kind of share this with your, uh, the, your audience because SARS, 17 years ago is called a severe acute respiratory syndrome, right? It's a close cousin of COVID-19, but we know the pandemic was controlled very, very differently. SARS was controlled by quarantine, by isolation. Why? Because every person got infected by SARS, displayed severe disease, and 10% of them unfortunately died. For that reason, they all had very high neutralizing antibodies, so we just had a cohort in Singapore we followed. 17 years later, 80% of them still have very high neutralizing antibodies. So it's good news for the severe patients of COVID-19. I think there's a high chance of that will last as well. But of course, you know, with COVID-19, majority is mild or asymptomatic. That's why I think uh, even for those people who were recovered from the infection, the advice is that they should get at least uh, one dose of the vaccine after they take the you know C pass to know their neutral antibody level. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question asks whether or not the variant in RBD could increase infinity to ACE2 bound to plates. Has yeah. it an effect to lower neutralization inhibition in vitro or in vivo? Another very good question. So we have a manuscript going to be submitted soon so that we have examined the bonding affinity of these different RBDs to ACE2. And the ranking you know, for the three one I have uh, demonstrated to you is that the South African binds stronger than the UK and the UK binds stronger than the Wuhan strand. And so what we do is we normalize all of this binding and uh, using uh, monoclonal antibodies that uh, binds to a common epitope. And uh, so you see a difference in inhibition, but if we use the South African infective sera, then the South African C parts give us the best inhibition. So that's a very good question that there might be subtle difference, but uh, on a practical level, it's not impacted the differentiation because if we have zero from an individual infected with the South African variant, it gives us much higher inhibition 
than the UK or the Wuhan variants. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And I think our probably our last question asks again about the test and its evolution. Uh, yeah. Will this test be evolving all the time? What uh, kind of assurances can you give us for that? Sorry, what's the, the, the like evolving uh, following up on all the new variants? Yeah. Yes. Will the yeah, test be evolving to, in order to cater for new variants which have come, which are not yet? Oh, uh, yeah. hundred no. percent. I can guarantee you because uh, as a scientist, you know, that's my bread and butter. You know, we are like uh, observing all the variants on the horizon. But of course, we cannot do a CPAS for every variant. We only do the variants of concern defined by WHO or is having a huge impact already like that variant in India. We don't know if they would behave very different in CPAS, but we're going to do it, right? Because uh, variants, you know, if you're talking about variants, it has a, a mutation somewhere in the spike uh, gene that we have hundreds already, right? So we're not going to do that, but we will do the variants of concern. We have already displayed phenotype, either more transmissible or uh, uh, have a greater fitness. And uh, so these are the ones definitely, definitely I can guarantee that we are going to continue with the, the journey of uh, producing CPAS to catch up. And also, you know, the vaccine companies are going to do that too. So as soon as there's a new vaccine for a variant, we will guarantee, you know, promise we have a, a CPAS to measure that vaccine, yeah. Thank you very much. And that is where we need to finish for today. Uh, we are aware that there are a number of questions that we didn't manage to get to, uh, and we will get back to you offline after the broadcast finishes using the details that you've provided. I'd like to thank Dr. Lin Fa Wang again for his hugely important presentation and for answering your questions. I would also like to thank our webcast sponsor, Genscript, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com forward slash webcasts. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll join us again soon. Thank you.